Thank you, Diana Getch. Our last speaker is Natalia Melman Petrozella. Natalia Melman Petrozella is a scholar, writer, teacher, and activist. An associate professor of history at the New School, Professor Melman Petrozella studies the politics and culture of the modern United States, particularly issues of gender, race, identity, and class. Her first book, Classroom Wars, Language, Sex, and the Making of Modern Political Culture, published by Oxford University Press in 2015, explores the roots of the culture wars in American public schools, specifically amid heated battles over sexuality and bilingual education. Her latest research traces the rise of wellness culture since the 1950s, asking how and why Americans have increasingly linked food and fitness regimes to the pursuit of self-fulfillment. These scholarly pursuits are closely linked to her activist work as co-founder of Health Class 2.0, an experiential health education program that bridges a wellness gap in public school education and connects university mentors with K through 12 students. Professor Melman Petrozella's writing has appeared in the New York Times, Slate, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and The Huffington Post, and she has been featured as an expert historian in diverse media venues such as Brian Lehrer TV, The History Channel, and The Atlantic. She also writes a fitness history column for Well and Good, the national online magazine, and is co-host of the Past Present podcast. Today, Professor Melman Petrozella will speak about migration and its limits. Please welcome Natalia Melman Petrozella. Hello, welcome. Thank you for being here, for listening. Congratulations, and thank you, Larry, for including me. And to the New School, I did not go here like some of my esteemed um, fellow speakers, but I have been here as a faculty member since 2009, so it, it does feel like home in many ways. So, the first, uh, first event of the year, and we're talking about migration. And I know, because I was on the committee that helped select this theme, that it is very hard to pick a unifying theme that will speak to students who pick this place for the diversity of its offerings. What would speak to a group of people with such a wide range of interests? And it's true that the theme of migration is relevant to all of us in the most basic way today right here. We're all here together at this institution, and we all came here from different places. It even applies to me in more ways than being a professor here. I um, showed up as a college freshman to New York City as well in 1996, and I agree that there is something that unifies us not only in participating in that pilgrimage to New York City, but in choosing using New York City for college. No matter where we come from or where we're going, this passing through, this, this, this blah, blah. no matter where we come from or where we're going, at this moment of passing through this institution that begins today, we, sh we seek a shared language and experience. And I think that seeking that commonality is admirable, it's commendable, especially in a moment when the differences in our society among us can seem so insurmountably stark. I think especially in events in the last couple of weeks and um, year. And yet, and this is what I want to focus on today. I think there's a problem in racing too eagerly into the easy embrace of commonality, into the easy embrace of this is who I am, I'm sure of it, and I'm just like you. So here's what I mean. Just saying that we're all different, we all come from different places, and therefore we're all the same, we're all on a journey, we're all migrants together. It sure sounds nice, but it's way too simple. It reminds me a little bit of when I was a sixth grader and I was in a program, a very well-intentioned program called Understanding Differences. And the, uh, the example that sticks with me is that they showed somebody, a little girl on a screen, and they said, look, she has brown eyes. And the next picture, showed a little boy who was in a wheelchair and they said look he's in a wheelchair and the message was that having brown eyes is kind of like being in a wheelchair they're just differences and even as an 11 year old it seemed to me that that was a pretty facile interpretation of what it meant to be different that being born with brown eyes was very different from having to navigate the world from a wheelchair 
So let's think about this room. If you're sitting here and you come from New York or you come from New Zealand, you're having a very different experience of this first weekend right now. If you're from New York, but whether you're from Staten Island or Stytown, both New York City neighborhoods very nearby, one with a new school dorm in it, so are you. If you're on financial aid or if you're fully taken care of, if you're a first generation college student or if your parents have PhDs, if you sail through the turnstiles at this building or whether you had to map out a strategy to make sure it was accessible to you and your physical body, you're having a different experience right now. Forget New York. If you're struggling to follow the speech because English is, your, is not your first language and you've just arrived here from someone else or if you're a native speaker. If you were homeschooled or you went to a huge public high school or you've known since middle school what people mean when they ask you, what's your pronoun? Some of you probably have heard that for the first time this weekend, or not yet. Probably, yeah, probably so far, if you've been here a little few hours. If you usually walk into a room and feel the color of your skin or the accent of your voice or the size of your body instantly sets you apart from everyone else there, or you never feel that way, the fact that everyone else also migrated here from somewhere, from some different place, probably doesn't feel like that common of an experience at all. So I share these observations, not to burst the bubble, an admirable bubble of commonality we're trying to build together, but because these kind of definitions, these kind of conversations actually have power. So I'm a historian, so I can't resist going back to history here. How many of you, and I'm not going to call on you so you can raise your hands and be sure that I'll stop at that until you're in my class, then I'll call on you. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, we are a nation of immigrants? A lot of people here, right? Now, that is, how many of you think that that's a nice idea? I think it is a nice idea, right? And I think that there is some truth to it. It's a phrase that's used by Democrats and Republicans alike, used to describe the fact that the United States is made up of people who all came here at some point from different places. It's usually used with the best of intentions to unseat the hatred and the territorialism that we see today. Very often, recently, from a, a movement of white nationalists who say, this is our country, we're taking it back, right? From people who, are, who they other and say, this is not your country. But there's a real historical problem in this well-intentioned phrase, we are a nation of immigrants. In erasing the details, and not just because they add color, but in erasing the details and the circumstances of people's arrival here in what is today the United States. To go to the most dramatic example, can we say that we should easily collapse Perhaps the examples of someone brought here against their will on a slave ship, that that's the same thing as immigrating here by your own volition? I think not. As long as we're talking about volition, wanting to come here, coming here by your own free will, is fleeing religious persecution or rural poverty analogous to pursuing wealth or educational opportunity? I don't know, I don't think so. The list goes on, but you get it, right? That we race to these well-meaning expressions of commonality to show we're all really the same, we're all really the same, but there can be something pernicious in asserting too easily and too energetically and racing without thinking to that shared experience of commonality, which beneath the surface, I think, often is not quite that. So getting back to you and to me, let's talk about place and the importance of paying closer attention to where we come from. I grew up in the Boston suburbs. I moved to New York City, as I mentioned, in, in, in 1996, where I've been uninterrupted except for a few years um, when I went to the Bay Area for graduate school. So yes, I am that coastal liberal that you hear about. Sometimes that's a slur, sometimes not. But college, the journey that you're all entering right now, was the place where I, where I realized that we are just as defined by the places we have been as all the places that we have not seen. The Amtrak corridor where I grew up and spent my early years and its West Coast equivalent does have a worldview, world view, that corresponds in some ways to the stereotypes. But getting new eyes on what to me was just the air that I breathed was, is one of the great benefits of getting to travel around the country to participate in institutions like this one and to see that who I am is as much defined by where I've been as where I have not been and having the openness to realize that. I also, to show a little bit more about myself, I also grew up speaking Spanish, the daughter of an Argentine political refugee. I've shied away from the label, another 
thing that people use to, to another category that people use to express commonality. I've shied away from the label of Latino for most of my life, Latina, because I've always felt the fact that I present as white meant that I enjoyed too much privilege to claim an identity that in my experience had assumed a socioeconomic or racial struggle which mostly was not mine. But before I decided to become a history professor, I was here in New York floundering in that year right after college. Uh, it's another story, but I actually went to Wall Street right after college. Don't, we can talk about that another day. But I was floundering to think about what I wanted to do. And I decided to run as far as Wall Street from Wall Street as possible and to become a public school teacher. I became a Spanish teacher, and I taught a class which I was explained was, you're teaching the Latino kids. Most of them don't really speak English. I was like, but I'm a Spanish teacher. How does that make sense? And they said, no, 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 you'll just help them, okay? I walked into that school, I walked into that class confident in only one thing, that I actually spoke Spanish and would be able to communicate with these children um, who were struggling with English. What I found there was Chileans who had recently immigrated, who'd had their whole life in Catholic school. Dominican and Puerto Rican students whose um, primary struggle was the back and forth migration to their um, native lands was, or not even native, back, uh, back and forth migration to the lands of their parents was compromising their educational experiences. And then a whole swath of Mexican children whose main concern was citizenship. None of them, none of them could relate to me with my Argentine Spanish cultivated when I studied abroad in, my, in Madrid my junior year of college. It was in that experience there that I realized that this category of Latino, which I had thought was one thing that didn't define me, was actually something totally different than what I had thought, and it really didn't define anybody all that well. The limitation was with the label, not the people that it sought to define. So I share that personal anecdote because it's you know, a post-college reflection that you might be experiencing in a few years too. But I also share it because that personal reflection, that experience with grappling with my own identity was what led in part to my writing a book about the struggles of Latinos in California around Spanish bilingual education some years later. And my point here is that what begins with a strong sense of my own identity, I am that, I'm not that, this is where I come from, this is who I am, that created for me a real twinge of personal unease around that category, but it can become the spark that ignites an intellectual journey. For me, that intellectual journey was one that went on for almost a decade while I worked on that book. So, when I was asked to speak here for 10 minutes about migration, I thought, 10 minutes? I'll take two hours. This is way too complicated. But then the more I thought of it, I started to go to that default response my children give me. When I ask them to grapple with something they know is going to put them through the ringer and make their head hurt and their body ache just from the intellectual labor of it. Do I have to? And then my kids don't say this, but I, my thought was like, isn't there a TED talk on this that they could just play? Someone's figured this out before. But then I realized that sense of this is going to be tough and do I have to? But yes, I'm stepping up. That's what we do here at the new school. We don't let each other off the hook. We don't give each other the luxury of, I'll, let, I'll think about that later, or I'm going to sit this conversation out, or I'm going to wait until they figure it out and I feel totally safe in expressing my pat, done, my pat done opinion on this, and then I'll offer some perfectly polished thought. We don't do that here. Instead, we relentlessly push each other and ourselves and say, if you're going to do one thing, can you just engage? We're a community of English worry here, not just one professor cold calling you, you got the right answer, good for you, now you're dismissed. You didn't, Shh, no. We learn from each other in here, right? And I include myself as a faculty member in here. And I say that that is not always easy, just like I wanted to back away from the experience of having this, uh, the process of you know coming up here and discussing this with all of you. We feel the intensity and it's visceral of Raising your hand in class, and professors feel this too, speaking and thinking you have it all figured out, and then all of a sudden you're in this thicket of words and ideas and your face is red because it's not the way you thought it would be in your head when you first started speaking, but then also realizing and feeling the resilience that comes from that experience of doing that and feeling sometimes a bit humiliated, but picking yourself up and realizing that the courage to open your mouth and take that risk is exactly what you showed up for. So. 
here, I've told you the story about the way that my personal identity helped spark my intellectual journey, even as I figured out that identity was not everything. It actually wasn't what I thought it was at all in many ways. And I think that at our best, what we can do here together is not just stop at the easy words you'll hear, he, you, you will hear here many times because they are useful of, oh, that's messy, that's problematic, it needs to be unpacked, right? Those are good things, but th those are useful useful concepts and words, but those are starting points. And I think that just like the identities that we show up here with in this room today, those are starting points for where you will end in four years, but also the process that we'll engage in as we migrate through this institution together. If you think that we can never, and we don't wish to, I think, ever completely escape or transcend the identities that we show up here with, it's not possible, it's not desirable. But what I hope that I can offer you as a professor but also that we can commit to together is to see up out of our own identities, to understand how they've been constructed, and to understand how we can work together to, to understand them better, but also to change them and to emerge from here together something different, something new, something better. So welcome. I'm glad that your migration pattern has landed you right here. And come find me. I'm here. <laughs>